today. I'm so uh, honored to be invited. Uh, I spent 27 years in Nevada and did many projects there and know, um, uh, know the area quite well and uh, miss, miss you guys. I raised a family there and um, uh, home means Nevada. So, um, I'm still uh, admitting, good. Darrell, maybe you could admit people as they come in. Alrighty, I think I, I'm ready to go. So these are the three seminars that we're doing. And the uh, first one is an overview. I'm going to do science of reading stuff. Uh, the next one, I'm looking at emergent and beginning and transitional literacy. And then the third one, I'm looking at intermediate and advanced. So we'll look at it developmentally, but I'm also going to take your questions that you send in at the end and answer them either directly to you or uh, by way of my uh, handout uh, presentation next time. And so you see the science of reading question at the end. I'd like you to share one question one bright idea from the first session today. You could share a golden line. And so that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start with an activity called golden lines, uh, interesting uh, golden lines activity that you could use tomorrow. Um, so what I do, and I do it when I read to children and I do it when I'm uh, having students read and I want them to find the golden line as well. Uh, here we go. So you uh, help them find it. Uh, the important ideas, uh, or it's just said in a, in a neat way, uh, or it's eloquent, a favorite phrase. Uh, if I'm reading Sylvester and the Magic Pebble, uh, some kids say pebble because they don't know what a pebble is. But for me, the word there is uh, Sylvester. I just like saying Sylvester. Uh, similarly, uh, I have my older students uh, write down these interesting golden lines. Actually, I have, I have a place for them in their uh, word study notebooks. And there's a golden line. A child is a butterfly over the seething whirlpool of life. How can one give it steadiness without weighing down its flight? How can it be tempered? without tying its wings. And that would be a theme for me in terms of trying to teach the child just where they're at. So uh, I know that I have limited time with you. So I'm going to share in these 10 slides, the most important ideas I have for you today. And then I'll go into the science of reading and some of the research that you may be familiar with. So. If there's one slide, there are two slides that I would say this about. This is one of them. What is word study? So when I'm teaching phonics, I'm also teaching spelling. When I'm teaching spelling, I'm also teaching phonics. So the days of having a, a separate spelling program are over uh, for most of us in that we are doing a spelling program to teach phonics. And at the upper levels, we're looking at spelling as a way into vocabulary instruction. So they all fit together. And that's why we call this an integrated approach. And you can use the materials that you have. You can use your spelling program and adjust it to match your phonics and at the upper level vocabulary. And that will be my goal uh, throughout is to share that with you. So the rationale, why word study? Well, we want them to be readers, successful readers and writers, that's obvious. And this is important. Becoming literate depends on the fast, accurate recognition of words in text and the fast, accurate production of words in writing so that readers can focus their attention on making meaning. You have to be able to read the words quickly and easily to hold the syntax together to make for meaningful text. And I'll be showing you this uh, in the science of reading section. Developmental word study. Now remember, I'm calling this developmental word study as opposed to just word study. 
because we use a developmental model. And word study explicitly teaches students with hands-on activities, the vital skills necessary to excel at word recognition, spelling, and vocabulary. That hands-on stuff is a lot of what uh, many people would consider the multi-sensory aspects, which we'll talk about a little further along. So right now I wanna talk about what is orthography? That's the $10 word that I'd like us to have that uh, allows us to integrate reading and writing conceptually. When I'm teaching writing, I'm teaching reading. And when I'm teaching reading, I'm teaching writing. And so I also want to talk about three layers of the orthography, five stages underneath those three layers. So we are looking at two components. I'm sorry, there are people that want to be admitted. Orthographic knowledge has two components. Uh, one is a memory for how words are spelled. And the second is the knowledge of the patterns that govern the spelling. So you need both. You need a memory for the spelling, and you also need to be able to see patterns. And when I talk about dyslexics, I think of people who have trouble seeing those patterns, trouble memorizing the words. And we'll look at that in more detail. Here's a little fun. What does ortho mean? Ortho means, and this would be a lesson, but I'm giving it away. Ortho means correct or straight. What does an orthodontist do? It makes your teeth straight. What does an orthopedist do? It makes your bones straight. And if you're orthodox, you're pretty straight. So ortho means straight and graphic means writing. Straight writing is the study of orthography. And it's essential to understanding reading and spelling. And it's what makes reading and writing part of the same process. process. Uh, I think of Airy, who I've studied my whole career and Chuck Perfetti's work. Uh, their work really shows us uh, along with Ed Henderson's work, some of these points. So there's a reciprocal nature between reading and writing instruction and development. Reading informs writing and writing informs reading. You can't show me, show me a great writer who isn't a great reader. Uh, they are, uh, uh, Stephen King knows everybody in his genre. He's a prolific writer and quite a reader as well. Let's look at spelling instruction. Spelling is a part of literacy instruction. Matter of fact, in colonial days, when you bought a speller, that was your phonics program. And so spelling is designed to teach phonics, vocabulary, and morphology. Students, and this comes from Stephen Graham's work, students learn more about reading from spelling than they do about spelling from reading. Spelling is, an, is a way of teaching reading, phonics in particular. So I want us to reconceptualize why we're teaching spelling and how we teach phonics and, um, and, and vocabulary. This is the developmental model that, are, uh, that I spend my whole life with my, my research with. And so at the top, you see three layers, alphabet, pattern, and meaning. And then in the middle, you see th five stages of reading and writing, the emergent, the beginning, transitional, and then the intermediate and advanced. Next time, I intend to look at the first three stages, and then the time after that, the last three stages. There with some overlap. And you know that I'm interested in spelling because spelling, if you can spell it, I know you can read it pert near always. And so the spelling is a conservative measure of what people know about words. That's why it predicts reading achievements so well. That's why we look at the spelling to understand the student's orthographic knowledge. Um, this is my, uh, the, the textbook that I, uh, uh, brought to University of Nevada, Reno some years ago. 
uh, before it was published and uh, all the references you'll find here as well. Uh, if you wanna be more particular, these are our other textbooks, pre-K, um, et cetera, vocabulary, um, EL. So there's a synchrony among reading, writing, and spelling. They go together. I should be able to look at your spelling and predict how you'll read. And I'll be right a lot of the time. So here's the developmental model again. We have emergent reading at the top, emergent spelling. And then we have the three layers of writing, which I'll show you again in just a moment. But these are the five stages of reading and spelling. And you can see the rough grade ranges. So if you're a transitional reader, we see that between the first and fourth grade. That's a, quite a range. But I've been in classrooms, sixth grade classrooms uh, throughout the country, uh, where a third of the students are still transitional uh, uh, readers like uh, uh, H-I-J-K, uh, or they are within word pattern spellators. They're still looking at long vowels. So uh, you have to take people where they're at developmentally. And these, this is a, a good sense of the scope and sequence. It's not all the skills, but you can see under the alphabet layer, we have beginning consonants. And then by the time we're getting into patterns, we're looking at the short vowel pattern, but also the long vowel patterns. And then finally, morphology, the meaning layer. Uh, that's a word I like us to use a bit more. Uh, morphology is the structure of words, everything from prefixes and suffixes all the way down to Latin roots, Latin stems and roots, Greek roots. We also look across languages. We want to see what students know in their other languages and how they use that language to learn English. We're also doing dual um, immersion programs, and we, we do teach word study in Spanish, uh, although a little differently given the orthography is a little different. Uh, that's why we, I enjoy studying Chinese or Romanian or French. These tell us about the orthography of those other languages. And I know you have a ton of languages in your schools and that, that we, I'd be glad to talk about further. But these are the three layers, sorry, uh, three layers of the writing system that you would see in Spanish. Morphology the structure of words, the generative part of words. When I'm teaching one word, I'm teaching 10 words really, or when I'm teaching a root, it becomes exponential. So it's really about vocabulary instruction. And so here's a little bit of the research. Morpho morphological knowledge is related to word knowledge and comprehension. And uh, my good colleague, uh, Diana Townsend, does great work in these areas. Morphological knowledge of academic words um, is particularly important for academic achievement. Um, we know that over 90% of Greek or Latin, uh, the academic vocabulary has Greek or Latin origins. There are some references. So, this is a check-in. I don't have time to look with you and, and, and see what you would think, but, and we don't have time to look with, work with partners, but do you see a synchrony among your students in their reading, writing, and spelling? Now, if you don't see it, then I'm interested in why, and it does occur occasionally. We can see reading and spelling diverge, but most of the time we can get a, a, a good sense of why you and I may not see the synchrony, but in nearly all cases, we do see a match among reading, writing, and spelling. So that's my work, and those are the most important slides today, because I want you to think about orthography when we think about word knowledge. And as orthography allows us to teach reading and writing and spelling in an integrated fashion, well, we certainly have had SOR uh, on the brain here for the last couple of years. So uh, I'd like you to copy this. That, that's my best joke today. Um, this is the model of reading 
that I uh, grew up with in terms of my um, studies at with Eric Brown uh, at NYU, uh, the postdoctoral work. And I've learned that reading is one of the most complicated things that we do. Uh, and this model that you see in front of you that I will not be going through is anything from two to 22 seconds. It, at the top, it starts with a saccade. And the saccade is a French word for a flip of the feet in, in, in sailing. And then you have a fixation. Now for you and me, that fixation where we're seeing characters um, is uh, uh, 20, 250 milliseconds. And it's this wide, uh, it's six to 10 character spaces. So character, C-H-A-R-A-C-T-E-R. -A -A -E if you're lucky, you're going to see most of the word character. But what happens is you'll see some of the word and then, and then you'll take a saccade, which is very fast, ballistic, 20 milliseconds. And then you take another fixation and then you go chugga chugga, return sweep. Now, why, why am I telling you this? Well, first of all, it's just fascinating. This is what I love to study. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, teaching reading, I'm a pretty good reading teacher, but this allows me to be sort of a, half-assed linguist. And I, I look at this stuff and try to understand it. Uh, so for example, your beginning readers, their fixations are much longer. And, and let me show you here. I wanted to go a little further into this. This is uh, the saccade that you see. And then this is uh, like one or two seconds. But what happens a lot is the babies, they have to read out loud when they read to themselves. Why do children finger point read? Why do they read out loud when they read to themselves? Because they need to buy processing time to put the words together. You and I subvocalize even when we're silently reading. We, it's hard to tell what the subvocalizations mean, um, but we are subvocalizing. But our babies, they need to be reading it aloud when they are reading words so slowly. But this is the fun part. Do you see this blue line? Once you have spent a few seconds, most of us, you say, oh, I can read this word and I can put it together syntactically. And what that allows me to do is to skip all the way down to comprehension. And then after comprehension is understanding. So when we talk about a, a simple view of reading, this is the simple view of reading that Philip Goff put together many years ago and that many people refer to. Well, there have been refinements, mind you, and the research is good, especially with the uh, brain work. But this is the basic model. And uh, uh, it is a complicated process and it calls on your language knowledge. Now, uh, these are table of contents from the International Reading Association. There, they, there are a couple of uh, issues that were devoted to the science of reading. Uh, this first one, um, uh, this is, I'll come back to it, but there are a lot of good articles here. Some I like and some I, I like a little more than others. Uh, Linnea uh, Airy has one I'll share with you. Um, but you see soci sociocultural, you also see um, uh, Teresa Roberts on early reading, and you see, oh, this is a good one, phonological awareness materials in Utah with Kathy Brown. Uh, she does excellent work, um, code-related work. Uh, we have morphological knowledge. Uh, David Scher at the bottom from Israel has a very interesting article on uh, writing systems in other languages and universals that underlie the science of reading. This is an excellent article on dyslexia. And here's an excellent uh, article by Linnea Airy, The Science of Learning to Read. And, and Linnea is a, a very dear colleague and an important colleague to our work. Now, this is uh, taken some popularity. This is the model from um, that special issue from uh, D Nell Duke and uh, Cartwright. It's an excellent model. I, I 
not in love with it. Uh, uh, I could tell you the critique of it, but uh, um, this is a good model that involves on the left-hand side, executive functioning and motivation and engagement. I spend my time here on word recognition and fluency and morphological knowledge. But I also, as a reading uh, person, I spend a lot of time with kids who have uh, difficulties learning language uh, before they even come to school. And so we do have kids who have language difficulties who later have problems with reading. And I'll be talking about that in our next meeting as well when I talk about emergent literacy. So more researchers study reading than almost any other subject. More researchers come from outside of education. Uh, research must include teachers and teaching settings. So I do read a lot of articles by people who um, have not had experience in the classroom and may not have the best ideas for remediation, intervention, MTSS. Uh, I respect their work, but um, we need to include more teachers. Look at all, uh, we could come up with another list twice as big. Uh, as a, so twice as large as this. But teachers and educators need to be more involved in a lot of this research. And so we have the science of reading. Uh, I don't know why we aren't calling it science of literacy because of that integration. Or there's also the science of writing. And I'm a knucklehead. I love uh, the science of orthography and developmental word study. That's where I spend my time. So there are an array of models. Uh, the simple view of reading is not so simple. Uh, the Duke and Cartwright, they call theirs the active view of reading. Uh, 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 that's a, a little odd because are you saying that the simple view is inactive uh, or that there's a complex view of reading somewhere? By the way, at the bottom, I do say the orchestration, that concept of orchestrating all of what we know about language and literacy is a useful concept to think about. So I like thinking about layers and stages. that are models for comprehension and thinking and understanding. I almost think of that as parallel sometimes. Uh, uh, that's not quite accurate, but they uh, are a little different. You can read without thinking, but you're not going to be a good reader. So there are some of those other models, the triple word form, the parallel, the processes, the modular. The, so there, are, I, I think we have to have respect for all these models. Uh, we need to talk to each other about what journals we read. If you read brain and language, you'll find some great studies there. Uh, but in terms of applying it to your teaching, uh, that will be uh, sort of a trick sometimes. That's been something that I've tried to do in my work is try to take the research that I gleaned in language and literacy and take it to us in our teaching. So one program or method versus another, I, I'm suspicious of these movements and I've seen many. I feel like it's fighting with your cousins. Uh, I don't know hardly anyone who's opposed to word study instruction. So often I start by talking about what are the essential components of literacy and what are your students' uh, development? Uh, what, what, where are they developmentally? Uh, in terms of the media, there's a lot of fighting over structured versus balanced literacy. Um, this is the third time in my career, 47 years, that we've had these quote unquote reading wars. Uh, there, when I came in, there was the whole language uh, battle and uh, uh, some people could equate uh, whole language and balanced literacy. I, I don't think that that's accurate, but uh, again, I need to start from your definition. Uh, is synthetic or analytic phonics best? And uh, the answer there very quickly is that you need to do both uh, is what we find and that the research isn't clear that one is better than the other. And as a teacher, I find myself doing both and I can talk further about that. The three queuing systems are something that we do use when we read, but it's not a method for teaching. So I think we're off track there. Uh, I, I wanted to tell you that one of the first, uh, my first university job in New York, where I moved to study with Eric, 
the person wanted someone who was versed in the psycholinguistic form of teaching reading. And what that really meant, it was code for uh, whole language or for Ken Goodman's work. And, uh, but I was used to a whole different definition of psycholinguistics that would start with Noam Chomsky in a very different form of thinking about literacy and psycholinguistics. So I like to talk about what the terms mean to teachers and uh, let's talk from there. Uh, uh, growing up, there was why Johnny can't read and why Johnny still can't read. And uh, Jean Chalk had the uh, book, uh, The Great Debate, and her work is very important. And she does have a stage theory that's very similar to our work. And uh, there have been, endless fights about whole word versus phonics. And uh, in fact, you need to do both. Uh, and um, these battles go back to the 18th and 19th century. And then more recently, we've been talking about dyslexia. And again, it comes down to your definition. Um, what percentage of your uh, children who are having difficulties are dyslexic. And uh, is it 20% or is it more like the 5% that I'm more comfortable with? We have now the MTSS, which is a wonderful movement with the tiered instruction. And after so many years of working in clinic, my professor Henderson sort of had a conundrum. Uh, is, is it uh, method or is it teaching developmentally? And uh, for me, uh, I, I'd rather look at the student's development and to see if we're matching our instruction, whether it's analytic or synthetic, to the child's development. And usually what you find is that you're combining uh, methods a bit. And I'll try to be more specific as we go. And this is one example. Uh, the IDA, the International Dyslexia Association, writes about structured literacy. And uh, that's a definition for them, I think. I think it's fair to say from their it is from their literature. And here's a chart that my colleague, Marcia Invernese, put together with her colleagues in a wonderful book on tutoring called Book Buddies. It just came out again on a third edition. And on the right, you can on the left is material from the Orton uh, from the IDA, and then on the right are what we would call word study activities and how we address these same components. I do wish I had time to read these with you today: uh, morphology, syntax, semantics. Uh, we are on the same wavelength in our teaching, and we add in the developmental model. And coming back, this is a sample of only 153,000 kids in Virginia, October, November, 2016. And you can look at their stages. So for example, with inward pattern, remember that's long vowels, and I'll be defining these in more detail, but you can see in third grade, 69% of the students were still looking at long vowels in October and November. 39% in second grade and only 6% in first grade at this time. So I, I know what your standards say. Your standards may say actually that kindergartners need to be early with inward pattern spellers, uh, but that you have to teach people where they're at. So if you're a sixth grader with a, at the within word pattern stage, that's the way I'm going to teach you. Uh, I'm tutoring an adult who is a late within word pattern, we might say. And uh, we're, that's what we're working on is long vowel patterns in addition to a lot of vocabulary work. Darrell, any questions that I should address at this point or is it okay to go ahead with assessment? Yeah, I think move forward. I have not seen anyone pop in any questions. Oh, no. I love to be uh, sidetracked. I did have I'm one a, question, if that's okay. I could put it in the chat or I could... Give it a go. Um, my uh, daughter is um, a really is a good reader, I really think, and she does well on standardized tests, like have evidence, um, but she struggles with spelling specifically. So earlier you were talking about, you know, usually there's a triangulation. Yes, so yes. whether it's now or later, any... Um, 
tips that you would have for someone that that has one strength over the other? Good, good. Uh, I have to be convinced that there really is this difference. So I'll try a couple of questions and then uh, you'll write to me, but I'll show people sort of my tact at this point. So what grade is she in? She's an eighth right now. Uh-huh, uh -huh, okay. And um, uh -huh. what's her reading rate like? So she is fluent. She has good intonation, great with dialogue, good writer. She writes with dialogue, imagery, characterization. Um, but uh, still will sometimes, if she's in a hurry, do T-H-A-Y. Uh, she spelled yearn, yearned the other day. She was trying to use yearned, U-R-N-E-D. Um, so sometimes way back, you know, like the T-H-A-Y and sometimes really more multisyllabic complicated. Yes, um, and you'll find middle syllables dropping out of those polysyllabics. Um, um, uh, what's her reading rate like? You said good intonation, but if you and she were sitting down to, together, would she be significantly behind you if no, you were reading I would, silently? I wouldn't say so. She is a little slower, uh, li slower than I am, but not like a concern. Um, okay. I would, as a, as, a, as, yeah. as a teacher, I would look at that a little bit, just okay. a little bit, not, in a, not a big deal. Um, any um, difficulties growing up in terms of learning to read? Yes. In first grade, um, they had a teacher, my, both my daughters had a teacher that came down from third and didn't, uh, had, wasn't quite on the developmental, you know, continuum. So I tutored them myself in first grade uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and caught up. But that first grade is where they had, you know, lower like map scores and things like that uh, until they caught up around second and third after the tutoring. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not going to be able to get very far. I would take, uh, but I'd be glad to do do it offline. Uh, but for those of you who are listening, I'd look at a writing sample and look at the quality of the errors. The errors that you made uh, that you gave me are sensible, but a little more primitive than what we would expect for someone who's reading on grade level. Um, so that I, I I appreciate what you're saying. Um, there are children who have uh, genetic difficulties with uh, uh, spelling, um, but oft, but usually the reading goes with it. And that's why I'm interested in, okay, she may be talented verbally and can figure things out. Some kids, in a sense, uh, compensate, uh, but other kids um, are dragged down by it and, they, and they're in fifth grade and it takes them forever to, to read what they're assigned and they're inaccurate and their comprehension isn't particularly good. But you, you said her comprehension is good and she's got good strong verbal skills. Um, I would also talk about what has happened when I've tried good uh, spelling instruction with her. Uh, and then I'd look, I'd probably give her uh, one of our spelling inventories uh, just to see from there. Um, and that would be a start. I'm sorry, I, but it, but it, it, but that's why we have to take a close look. Yeah, so, that's yeah, great. Thank in you. A regular a place, class, place to in a start is helpful. <laughs> yeah, in a regular classroom, there will be two. In a fifth grade classroom, I know you said eight. There may be a few kids who are uh, sort of in this direction uh, who I want to take a look at. Thank you. Um, so mm -hmm. assessment in the middle, primary, elementary and upper level. We have Spanish assessments um, and they've been validated and studied statistically. The And I've been making up others as well, which I will show you. But you can see that they start from easy words and get harder. And then we have a scoring guide. And there's even a page in Words Their Way that tells you how many they spell correctly. They'll tell you what stage and early, middle, or late. This is a concordance that you could see the uh, Fontes and Pinnell levels under letters. And then you can see their stage of spelling and see how that, they're related. Grade level, at the end of third grade, I expect a student to be early syllables and affixes. You can look at children's writing to understand their development, but the spelling helps you because you can see it over time. 
These are other spelling inventories. So here's take. And then the first place where they miss two or more is where you begin instruction. And that would be true with your daughter, uh, looking at their development and going up. So these, this is a third grade classroom and you can see their spelling, but this is also where I would begin to think about my uh, differentiated reading groups. So I do do differentiated reading uh, a fair amount in my classes. Uh, there are other times when I'm not, uh, but my word study and my level of reading uh, are often the same groups. I often use my spelling to help me think about my reading groups because of that synchrony among reading, writing, and spelling. This is a teacher in Chicago in sixth grade. And you can see all the different levels. I mean, she's got kids who are still spelling bet, B-T, or uh, uh, pet, P-T. And she thought she had five groups or uh, one, two, three. And she did have a push in a uh, special educator with her. But I'm telling you that five groups is a lot to manage unless you have a couple of push ins. So I try to go for three groups. And I'll show you that as well, but this is a Spanish speaker and you can learn about what they use from their Spanish, the flapped R to represent uh, with the D there, flap D. This is another Spanish speaker who's using the EI to spell place. And we can look closely at children's spelling. Uh, this is another Spanish speaker, Espoyo. There are no SP blends in Spanish, and so that's why you see the Espoyo. And there are no EDs, so it tells us about their language development as well. This is the Spanish spelling inventory, and here is one of the examples. And so children use what they know in one language to uh, learn another language. So by looking at this, I can predict how their reading might be and how they're learning in English. Uh, this is a child who I, I've been making up these content area spelling inventories. And I wonder if you think that this child, uh, that her reading would be on grade level. And uh, she was in uh, fifth grade. I'm sorry, sixth grade. So if you look at her spelling, it is more primitive, but she was able to read her text. She did have a classmate whose reading fell behind and uh, uh, he was unable, but this is close enough. You see, reading is going to be ahead of spelling. You have encoding in the spelling and decoding in the reading. So my question to you now is, what stages do you see in your classroom? What two or three groups would you think about in your classroom? And then we can start thinking about the materials that you'll want to use. So if I had more time, I think I would have you uh, respond uh, to this, or maybe you want to respond at the end of the class. Darl, any other questions that were going to come in? I'm not seeing any. So let's press on. What I'd like to share now is the structure of the word study lesson. And it starts with demonstrate, sort and check, extend, reflect, and extend. So. And I'll show you five day sequences in just a moment. In our word study, we want the students to be exploring the word patterns or the whatever we're teaching every day, but they don't have to necessarily do it with us. So when I demonstrate and I go through this lesson plan format, that's a 15 minute lesson. Uh, but thereafter, I may call the group to, to the kidney bean table 
and I may have them sort in front of me. And when they sort, I'm looking for these things. Did they sort accurately? Did they sort fluently? And then could they talk about the sort? Could they reflect on the sort? Those are the things that we're looking for. And then finally, can they generalize to their writing? We're not just studying long E, the, those few words with long E. We're studying long E generally. And that has to generalize to other words. So on the first day, I, I demonstrate the sort. And then I have the children sort and check in front of me. Third, we talk about it. Why did you sort the way you did? And then finally, I need to come up with activities that they can use every day to examine the word study. So let me show you some of that now. Here's Ms. Flores from Washoe County. And she is demonstrating the sort to her students. And there are videos in the Words Their Way materials that show you these. And she was having the students do a partner sort. And now she's sending them back to their seats with their own sorts. And that's what the sort looked like. And so they will, on the next day, write this sort into their word study notebook. And after the first couple of weeks of school, they can do that at their seats. They don't need me to watch them do this. And these are some of the activities that I'd like you to have under your belt uh, when you're doing word study. And you can see that they're highly multisensory. Uh, they are active. And they also require students to talk about what they're learning. So here's a game and we teach the students, yes, you can't take the cards or whatever uh, until you explain why that works. Where they play games on the floor. Here are some of the schedules. So in the primary grades, we think of three areas of the classroom. Circle is with me. That's where I'm demonstrating the sort. That's where I'm watching them sort. That's where we're talking about it. Centers are where they will do their own activities, word study activities. I usually have about eight centers around the room, and a couple of them will be word study centers. And then they have seat work. And that always involves, uh, there are always are uh, word study activities. Here's a weekly schedule. So that's what you're aiming for now that the school year has started. What's going to be your weekly schedule? It doesn't have to be a Monday, but on Monday in this case, you introduce the sort and you watch students sort. But then they're also working by themselves. And so word study is about 15 minutes a day but a lot of it, once you get the routines down, are independent activities. Every word sort has a generalization with it. This one happens to be with the Latin root duck, vert, and fur, uh, to ferry across, to carry, to bear. And so those are the five activities, uh, six activities that these upper level word study students would be pursuing. They're going to do an interactive sort. They're going to do a writing sort, blind sort, speed sort. These are games and activities that give them practice with the activity. So here's a sort and we can have the students do it as a speed sort. We also encourage them to take it home and to uh, share that with their parents. We have a program where you can assign it out to students. Here's a four-day sequence with Mrs. Weisner in St. Paul, and she was a teacher of English learners. And so she's introducing this sort, and don't you know the U is a pretty tough sound. And so she's introducing not only the spelling, uh, short U versus long U, but also the sound of U and doing some vocabulary. The kids didn't know the word rug. 
And so they come up and sort. And then they review the sort. Then they practice the sort individually. And then they show a friend and they talk it through with a friend. A lot of partner work. This is Mandy Grotting, and she was a second grade teacher in Washoe County, an excellent teacher she was and is. She had 17 children who were at the same stage. So she decided to have these 17 kids at the pocket chart. She introduced the sort, demonstrated the sort, talked about the sort, and that our controlled sort is sort of tough. But then she divided the 17 into two groups so she could really get close to the kids to see what they were up to. Other kids were at their seats, finishing off the sort from last week, sitting in a pod, completing a sort in a different group, writing the sort into her word study notebook. Oh, and that's me on the left, cheating just as much as I can, but we don't call it cheating, we call it working together. Sheep in a Jeep is a great game. Now I'm going to share with you some of the forms we use for helping to organize your instruction. This is a grading period and I have the students grade themselves. Sometimes with the uh, intermediate grades, I don't need to see them every day. And so this is an offset group where I may only see them three times in small group. This is a teacher in Washoe County, Ms. Bruscotter, fifth grade. Very interesting class. And I, this is the last group I'm going to share. Let me share this with you. She had kids who were still working on short vowels, long vowels, and two syllable words. And what I want to get across is that she's doing whole class work at the smart board, and she's looking at affixes, uh, in this case, prefixes. And because that's a standard that all kids need to know. But then she differentiates in small group according to their stage at the bottom there. I'll show you a little bit around her classroom, but I'll also be going back to Bruce Goddard in our third visit. I'm really only looking at developmental groups here. She has four groups. And so she has one group at the syllables and affixes stage looking at open and closed syllables. And then her whole class is looking at affixes. So that's a whole class activity. You can see the kids sorting, they're talking. And this is a video that's quite available to you online as well. This is that small group and they've come in the second day with their word study notebook and they're discussing open and closed syllables. And there, this is the child from another group and she's writing the sort into her word study notebook. And here's, here's a child in the pink uh, doing a game, leading a game of a blind writing sort. Later I'll come to this again, but if I'm looking at the components of word study, these are the 10 things that I would look for. Number one, are you differentiating? We have to teach people where they're at. And then do you have good materials and organizational skills? And then third is a big one, teacher talk. Does the teacher talk facilitate student talk? 80% um, of uh, some studies show of our teacher talk is really just routine asking questions about procedure. Instead, we want to ask open-ended questions that can't be answered yes or no, that get students to think about their word study. So I've organized these 10 into organizing instruction. Number eight, do they know how to use a word study notebook? And group two, this is that student talk. Number seven, 
student reflection. We did a study and we found that uh, you can tell the difference between a strong word study class and a not so strong word study class by number seven. Did the students talk about what they were learning? Uh, I'm really ending now uh, to tease you, some of you upper level people. These are free websites. Uh, uh, the third one does have a, no, the last one does have a price later on, but um, it's a wonderful thing to have so many websites to do upper level word study. Not sure why I put it in there, uh, but this is the synchrony of development. This is what I live by in terms of planning my instructions. I wish you all happy word study, and I invite you to join us. Uh, I don't know how many more I can take, but uh, I'm doing a for free uh, uh, collaborative, sort of like a PLC, and you're welcome to join us. The first one is September 14th, uh, teachers all around the country. Uh, I'm going to flash some uh, references to you. You have this handout, and you can go chase these if you want. Um, I have a website with a lot of uh, video and articles for you. So would you take the time now to, at the bottom, uh, share one question or bright idea from this first session? And uh, if you'll take a moment to do that, I'll check in with Darrell. And Darrell, uh, Dr. Kiernan, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it feels great to be back in Nevada. Thank you. We enjoyed. I learned every time I listen to you and I've listened to you for a number of years, I always learn something new. So thank you for sharing your deep expertise today. Um, I just dropped the link to our Google form in the chat. Um, we did have one question from Amy. We have three minutes to close. So I, I believe we have enough uh, minutes left, Amy, to address your question about when you try to form three groups what guides your decisions in moving students up or down? What was the last? What guides my decision? How do you make decisions about moving some students up or down to form your three groups? Good, good. Sometimes it's uh, ego. A kid needs to be a leader. Um, sometimes it's just the numbers of the, that I need to make work. Uh, but it's definitely where they're at developmentally. So when I'm looking at their papers, uh, and I say, this kid is a late letter name, but I'm not so certain. I may put an arrow going to the left. Uh, I try to have balanced groups in terms of size. Um, uh, sometimes like in, in Mrs. Grotting's class, uh, there's a big group that I break up. Sometimes I've worked with teachers next door to me and she'll take the high, you know, the, the kids from a high group, and I'll take kids from another group, and that will help me balance sometimes. But I just don't find that it's very efficient to try to manage five groups. In first grade, I can do four groups and then get it down to three. In kindergarten, I'll have stations, maybe even five, st five stations, but they're very brief and quite interactive. Um, uh, um, so some students, I want them to concentrate more on the word study than on the reading, and that may help me to influence. I hope that helps. Um, the other thing that I do is I sit with my colleagues and I ask them what they think, and that's often helpful. I don't know the phonics for reading program with your RTI. I am going to talk about intervention and um, Yes, um, you can use your uh, materials from that program and do word study activities with them. And we have a ton of games for you as well. Um, you bet. All right, we are five o'clock. We are at the top of the hour. I want to respect your time. Thank you for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you at webinar two. Um, and I will send out a link to the handout just like I did today. And um, I will see you back. Thank you so much.